Thank you, Joe Pat, for those beautiful words and for your lifetime friendship with John and John's family. Bishop Choby, thank you for being here. And Father Steiner and all the members of the Cathedral Parish, thank you for your wonderful hospitality. And thank you all for coming. John Sigenthaler had what the Irish called the gift. He understood both the power of words and how to wield them. He was a writer, and as all gifted writers are, he was deeply spiritual. This is what I would like to ask us to remember today as we gather in this holy place to ponder the mystery of God and John's participation in that mystery. And it is what I hope we continue to recall as we speak of him in the days to come, that he was a deeply spiritual man. I think I need to pause a moment and ask, can you imagine what John would say if he heard me say this? <laughs> Charles, you're out of your mind. <laughs> but I can get away with saying it for two reasons. First, John's not here to dispute it with me. <laughs> and secondly, I believe it needs to be said, John was a deeply spiritual man. And truly, at first glance, most of us might not see what I'm talking about. John did not have the demeanor of a contemplative. But remember, neither did the disciples, for it was the disciples who said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty? or in prison or without a home? And his answer was, as long as you did it for the least, you did it for me. In other words, as long as we're concerned about the injustices in the world, we're concerned about God. We know that John certainly was so concerned about injustice. Thus, John was a disciple. And he manifested this in a uniquely American way. What fueled him was a proposition, a proposition. Many claim belief in this proposition, but John internalized it, protected it, nurtured it, and lived it. And what is this proclamation? It is our classic American doctrine that Abraham Lincoln reminded us of when he said, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I believe that this was John's singular focus. He lived and breathed this pro proposition in all his dealings. He recognized it as a work in progress begun by our founding forefathers. A passionate student of history, John knew that they not only believed it deeply as a doctrine that was self-evident, but undertook to work it out over time. And so did John. We grieve at his passing, not because of the great accounts of his courage only, his contributions only, and his leadership we grieve not only because he shaped the life of a city and helped to bend history toward justice, but because he continued to evolve his work, to work this out as a way all the way to the end. More than a sage, in his own time, he wore the same mantle and carried the same torch as the founding fathers. I look at all his struggles and his successes, at the threats he received and countered, and marvel at the extent to which he was a bridge between the challenges faced by a new nation and the challenges faced by an evolving one. He realized that Lincoln's reaffirmation of the proposition ending slavery evolved into LBJ's civil rights bill in the 60s. And today's gay and lesbian struggles, as well as the ongoing debate for a greater respect for the doctrine of religious freedom, become another part of this unfinished project. 
At one of the last public events that John attended at the First Amendment Center, he and Marion Wright Edelman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, discussed their lives. John was asked why he did what he did in saving someone on the Shelby Street Bridge, now the Sigenthaler Bridge, or going to the defense of the Freedom Riders in Montgomery. And he answered with a simple question. When you see it, how can you not respond? When you see it, how can you not respond? In both cases, John acted on his best moral instinct in coming to the defense of another, and often, it seems, at the expense of himself. John's brother, Tom, told me of a small moment when John's instinct left a big impression. When Tom was a boy, Brother John took him Christmas shopping downtown at Kastner Knotts. And when finished, all they had left was money to ride the bus home. But John saw a panhandler nearby and gave him the bus money, and they had to walk home. His remark, there's more to Christmas than shopping. In all these three stories, John was not the dispassionate brother or journalist or presidential assistant. He was a man both trusting and following his gut, and any consequences be damned. All of us who know John Sigenthaler can tell a story of his coming to our aid or to our defense, for he spent a lifetime coming to the defense of others, especially the poor and dispossessed, the marginalized, those segregated and left out. Where does an instinct of this caliber, this internal moral compass, where does it come from? For John, it was nurtured in the fertile soil of a family of Christian believers named Sigenthaler and Brew, who were part of another larger community that gathered here at the cathedral and its school next door. Besides his parents, Mary and John, and his aunts and uncles, there were grammar school teachers and later the faculty at Father Ryan High School, especially Father Theophane. John told me the story of Father Theophane, giving him a book on social justice. He said he never knew why Father singled him out of the crowd, but it had a pivotal and lasting influence on his life. Is it any surprise, as we reflect today on his storied life, that the printed word would mold this young man? By his own assertion, journalism was always a means to achieve his goal, his vision. Yet he said that had his beloved friend Robert Kennedy lived and become president, he would have left the Tennessean and served in whatever capacity he asked. But as we consider his impact from today's vantage point, it is hard to imagine a more fitting profession for a man who could, who could turn a simple sentence into a sharp blade, a soothing balm, or a clarion call. For words fascinated him, captured his imagination, instructed him, and gave direction to his life. As influential as the American proposition was in giving him focus, Words, both written and spoken, shaped this focus. They were his diet, and they came from sources all over the world. Those words came that inspired him not just from Christianity, but from other great spiritual traditions, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and all the major religions. Those words came from world leaders, Churchill, Lincoln, Mandela. They came from spiritual voices, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Oscar Romero, Desmond Tutu, Mother Teresa, Dorothy Day. They came from poets and writers, philosophers and scholars, Shakespeare, Faulkner, Socrates, Kant, Camus. They came from definitive words encased in parchment or stone, the Declaration of Independence, the Magna Carta, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Emancipation Proclamation. They came from groups and individuals, anonymous in their origins, but well-known in their charismatic appeal, the Quaker pacifist tradition, the 1960s student protest against the war, 
the civil rights movement, the abolitionist movement, the women's rights movements, the liberation movements in Africa, in South, Amer South America, in the Middle East. And they came from solitary individuals standing up for freedom and justice in town meetings, neighborhood associations, in the classroom, on the ball field, at the supper table. These words inspired him from all those sources, and he never forgot them and always wanted to be in the middle of them. Those conversations encouraging and challenging and exhorting everyone. These encounters were food and drink that saturated his spirit, filling his soul to overflowing. So today, John brings us together for more spiritual conversation. That's what we're doing in this liturgy. Today, he encourages us still, not really to honor him, but to continue the defense of human rights and to carry out the dream of our founding fathers that all men and that all women are created equal. I read a quote from the 19th century philosopher and psychologist William James that made me think of John. He said, the sanest and best of us are of one clay with lunatics and prison inmates. And death finally runs the most robust of us down. Surely John was one of the sanest and best of us. Yet as robust as he was, death finally ran him down. He was at peace with this. Death is, after all, the great equalizer. He has done all, he had done all he could. It was now his time. Now it is our time. His life challenges us before death finally runs us down. To remember that we are all of one clay and to follow our moral instincts to come to the aid of another. For when you see it, how can you not respond? I began by saying John Sigenthaler was a deeply spiritual man. We know he was not a saint. He was a man of clay, but he was a disciple. There is a Catholic prayer for the dying that was said for John as he was leaving this life. In the name of God, the Almighty Father who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God who suffered for you, in the name of the Holy Spirit who was poured out upon you, go forth, John, faithful Christian. May you live in peace this day. May your home be with God in Zion, with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with Joseph and all the angels and saints. Go forth, faithful Christian. Go forth, faithful Jew. Go forth, faithful Muslim. Go forth, faithful Buddhist. Go forth, faithful skeptic. John says, you are all of one clay. So live this proposition as John did, that all women and all men are created equal. Live it. Respond. Charlie, that was beautiful. <laughs>